Tom McGuane has been attracted to the West since he was a boy growing up in Michigan. After a period in Hollywood as a screenwriter, he moved to Montana to raise a family and write. The Western landscape permeates his books. His work is filled with stories of long winters and fishing and hunting and raising cattle. The latest is called The Cadence of Grass. It tells the story of the Whitelaw clan after the death of family patriarch. I'm pleased to have him here for the first time. Welcome. Thank you. So you're sitting there in Montana and you want to write a story. Right. You want to write a novel. Right. Uh, and, and you decide what? Well, you decide that what is it about this imperial ego, which seems to have left, uh, been left uh, high and dry and relatively unblemished in these small towns, uh, that's, in, in, uh, that's unique. And one of, them is, one of the things is they can't really face mortality and look for strategies um, by which they can outlive themselves and yeah. continue to control people's lives even after they're gone. And uh, that idea began to fascinate me. I thought, what about somebody who's really trying to trying to rule after yeah. he's departed, after he's wandered around the backyard in his red knit cap and he's yeah. disappearing into <laughs> senility, but he's just going to really the, the lion's <laughs> paw on these uh, innocent lives. Yeah. And, the, and, and as all my ideas uh, uh, come to me, this one came to me both in comic form and in uh, tragic form. I mean, I always see these things the same way. I sort of see them... The, I see the overall uh, trajectory of the thing being kind of tragic, you know. But I see the, all the details of it as being comic. I mean, I don't know, this happens to be the, how, it, as a child of an Irish Catholic household, all things are seen this way. Yeah. Um, you know, the skepticism about mortality and our fate and stuff, but everything seemed very funny in the foreground. What did you want to explore here? I mean, we talked about the sort of every town has an alpha male and, and he wants to somehow uh, influence the events beyond his grave. Yes. And this is clearly what this man does because, you know, he leaves the bottling plant to yep. Paul and Paul is his son-in-law, and in order for them, you pick it up, in order for Paul, them to participate. Well, and Paul's sort of the Antichrist. I yeah. mean, he's this charming kind of diabolical character. Based what on anybody really, we know? Yeah, <laughs> well, lots of people, all too many people we know. But uh, I, I know kind of what I wanted to explore. I, I feel, you know, that all of us, and one of the peculiarities of living in America is that we can barely recognize where we grew up. Yeah. That if you, or if you move away for three years and come back, you can't find the house. Or somebody I knew who lived in a gorgeous suburb in, uh, uh, in Irvine, in California. Uh, they used to, I was with him one time. We were driving down the sidewalk, and he kept his thumb on the garage door opener. That was how he found his house. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, drive along with his yeah. thumb on the garage door opening. When you see one pop open, you drive in there. He's home. <laughs> so this kind of wildly deracinated lives, these yeah. wildly deracinated lives that we all are leading, and his lives are changing, and people who are valuable and ways of life that are valuable are vanishing, and we're all um, we're all kind of wondering what we should be valuing. I mm -hmm. mean, and so you're kind of looking around you're at, at this kaleidoscope of change and saying, where are the things, where are the va what are the values that I can retain? What's mm -hmm. important that's going on? What if it's disappearing? What, what should I help uh, to keep alive mm -hmm. uh, so that we won't have this kind of crazy cultural loneliness that uh, we, we have in, the, in this country or this feeling that, um, uh, that life is meaningless? A lot of people feel it's meaningless. Lots of them do. Lots of yeah. people feel yeah. and, and have you noticed in Montana any impact after September 11th in terms of sense of change about attitude, about living, about... Yes. Uh, the, the, the thing that I noticed is that um, I, I think a certain level of Montana isolationism ended then. People were heartbroken at what happened to New Yorkers. Yeah. Our and local that, fireman, you know, got up and with his own money and went to New York. Just stood there and you know, wondered what he could do. It's just amazing. I mean, that's just, I haven't heard that story, but it's just one story after another like that. Yeah. You know? And, um, uh, you know, I think Montanans maybe prided themselves on not being part of the overall nation. You know, that's it. we're different. This is like a nation. Yeah, we're more it, pure or something. Yeah, we're more pure or, our, you know, we're old. Or less fat. tainted or less, something, yeah. you know. And then we looked in and, you know, he's hear these guys with these heavy New York accents you know, firemen and policemen and all sorts of stuff, and everyone just, and we just, Montana just felt this thing, God, we're, that's us too. Same, we have the same values, we care yeah. about the same things, Yeah. It just our geography is different. That's all that's different, that's our all geography. Different. I agree, yeah. I agree. And that's what we found out on September 11th. Yeah, yeah. and that's a, I, that's a conviction I, I had before September 11th about life in America. I mean, I, you know, and it, it's, we are increasingly an island in a dangerous and hostile universe. Um, 
and as we pour 65 percent of the the world's uh, GNP mm. onto the same yeah, 50 right. states and wonder right. is this is that we're doing the best we could with this kind of power. Do you feel somehow, uh, I'm not sure, I know Tom may, Tom Brokaw, your great friend, may feel this too, I don't know, that somehow, despite all about the flaws, that somehow this American experience is unique. Oh, I absolutely feel yeah, it. I do too. I feel extremely positive about that. Um, and I feel... It's not that we're better than anybody else, but we have had a unique experience. We've had a unique experience and we really are a people. Yeah. Um, we're not we're not just a conjuries of other peoples. It's not the mishmash that the British used to think we were. Um, we really have become some sort of a people. I'm not that's not, I'm not judging us, but there's no, we're not like other people in some ways. Um, and 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 uh, we're going to we're going to have to figure out how we're going to navigate that sort of national personality through this minefield of a global world that's that's gotten quite a bit more dangerous recently. Back to the cadence uh, of grass. Why that title? Well, the cadence of grass has to do with this, this uh, longed for uh, uh, um, value system that, I, that we talked about a little bit before, which is that there are things about the natural world, about the life on Earth, that are cyclical, that are imposed on our, our, our uh, human fretfulness, and, um, and that will go on without us. <laughs> This is Kublai Khan, a savage place as holy and enchanted as air beneath. A waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the best epigraph I ever had for a book. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, did you find on. that? Have you had that sitting around for a while? or? I had it. Uh, I did have it in my mind for a while, and I yes. thought it particularly applied to this because um, the, probably among the cheaper ideas of this uh, novel are uh, the idea this this sort of simple preoccupation that m men like me have is that why do great girls fall for such rotten guys? <laughs> <laughs> and, and have you discovered the answer to that? Uh, no, but I explored it like a like a like a hole in my it, tooth. In here, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is Evelyn and Paul. Or yes. Man, the relationship weave in and out yeah. in here. Now, right. did, did you set all that out? I mean, did you find that halfway through, or did, did, did the characters take over, or did you work this out? A little, a little of both, and mostly through drafting. I mean, I drafted, wrote this thing out in longhand at 500 pages or something, the first run at it. Because what? It bleeds because, better that way out of your brain? Well, because I was trying to find it, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was, trying to, it was like trying to find the center of it. I knew it, was, it had a lot of voices. And I, I wanted it to move sort of inexorably as though it only had one voice. I wanted these people to be free as possible from the, you know, the ministrations of the author. I wanted them to get on with it. But I, at the same time, I know it's an artifact. It's a made thing. I wanted to make a novel out of this thing. But to get this thing moved along and shaped in the place, I couldn't just blast through it in a linear way. I had to write it and then try to write it like this and try yeah. to write it like this. And then finally I get, I remember having this feeling at one point, because I, I actually said it a lot. I said, there. There. Yeah. And it was a great feeling. Tom McWayne of Montana, The Cadence of Grass, uh, about the white laws and what happens to them and, and how they work through dysfunctionality and the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you for having Pleasure me. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.